Um, so this is designed for coordinators. Uh, I think we might have some inspectors on the line, which is fine. Um, but it's designed to, um, to kind of help coordinators get ready for the season. And all of the materials that we're sharing today, um, I will be sending links of all of these things um, out in a newsletter next week. So if you want to use this with training your own people, um, this is all going to be available to you. All right. So why are, all right, I can't see the top of my screen. Um, what is the threat? So I think a lot of people know this and that's why they're involved with this program. Um, but it is a good reminder. I have a lot of teenagers that I employ um, that maybe don't have um, a lot of background knowledge about invasive species. So um, they become invasive because they have no natural enemies, they, so they don't have any predators. And we're talking about plants and animals here. Um, they change the ecology of a lake. Uh, the impeding recreational uses is a big one for boaters, um, lower property values. I don't know if I have anybody here from Lake Arrowhead, but um, Lake Arrowhead folks could speak to lowering property values because of um, a milfoil infestation. So um, that's certainly a problem. Um, very hard to eradicate any, but there's, there's a few people on the line here who are, um, who are doing plant management. And once those plants are, are um, in your lakes, it's very hard to get them back out. Uh, and I do have the, um, most of these have a little thing at the bottom that says where in the handbook this information is found. So I think almost everybody is going to be getting in the mail or has already received their CBI supplies. And so you can follow along in the handbook if you've got it. Um, and I'm also going to send out a link to a digital copy of that. So, so everybody will be able to take a look at that. Um, it is a wealth of information. If, if you haven't seen it, I would suggest checking it out. So what is the law? Um, it is illegal to transport any aquatic plant on a boat, trailer, or equipment in Maine. Um, there is a fine associated with that. Uh, there's also a fine associated with not having the river and lake protection sticker. Um, I don't want to just read this whole thing off. People can read it themselves. but. Um, as far as the funding mechanism this year, I don't know if everybody is aware of this, but the sticker fee did go up this year. Uh, so for out-of-staters, it's $35 up from 20, and for Maine residents, it's $15 instead of 10. So I don't know if there's gonna be pushback on that from voters, but I think it's good to be aware that that, um, that change did go into place this year. So, and I, and I haven't talked to the wardens about how strict they're going to be about enforcing the sticker this year, just because it, it is hard to get them now. There's not as many places to, to get them. You can get them online, uh, but uh, obviously town offices and stuff are closed. What makes a good inspection? So this is kind of a long section. So be courteous. We know that. Um, don't be too pushy. Be informative, but not overwhelming. I think this one is important. Um, I have had feedback from boaters about inspectors that just hammered them with information. And, and that is, um, we don't want boaters to, to take one look at the yellow shirt and be like, I don't want to deal with this right now. <laughs> I don't want to be held up and, and talk my ear talked off. So I think it's good to be um, be informative but not overwhelming. Um, do a thorough inspection. I'm going to show you the the new inspection video that I put together, um, whip together, and those links. This the first link is to a video of John McFedrin doing a simple uh, inspection just by himself of what what a boater should be doing on their own, uh, and then that other link is the link to the new uh, training video, which I'll show after this. Um, inspectors will need to crouch down. Uh, just the prop is not enough. I have witnessed inspectors not actually looking at the trailer. You've really got to look underneath um, in order to, uh, to get a good look. This year, we're asking people not, not to touch the boat. Um, so that might be a bit of a challenge for some folks. Um, 
to crouch down and not use the boat as a um, as a steadying thing. So we've got a um, that might be a change this year. If a boater does not have the current year sticker, this year it's red, um, you can tell the boater about the penalty and where to get stickers. Um, this is a link where they can buy a sticker. There, um, there is a QR code in the CBI handbook, so somebody can scan that code with their phone, their smartphone, and it will take them directly to the site to buy the sticker. Uh, and if, if somebody has the receipt from buying that sticker, the game wardens will accept that um, and they won't get that ticket. Uh, so we have had out-of-state voters that will go that route, will we'll buy the this, this sticker online right at the launch um, to avoid that, that fine. So both of those are um, take you to the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife website to learn more about the sticker. And then if the boater refuses inspection, politely ask them to do it and step aside. Um, I, I just talked to some of my inspectors yesterday and some of them are a little bit nervous about um, beha boater behavior. I mean, we've all, we've all watched the news and, and heard stories of people behaving poorly in this time. Um, so I've advised my inspectors if, um, if anybody gets pushy at all or confrontational, we're backing right off. Even if you have a strong opinion about why we should be wearing masks, we, um, it is not our place to be educating voters about that part. We are there to do inspections, educate them about invasive species. So I'm not sure what voter uh, behavior is going to be like if we're going to see an increase in people refusing inspection. But um, we need to be aware of that and... Um, and tell our inspectors that to back off if there's any any kind of confrontation we should just be backing off. So there's a big section in the handbook about how to talk to boaters, how to approach, how, all kinds of good information. And then new challenges. So uh, this is a section that we added I think last year and it's about invasive animals. So we we focused on plants for a long long time. Um, milfoil and hydrilla, curly leaf pondweed, which are our invasive species we have in our main lakes, but there are invasive animals that we're watching out for. Um, uh, the different mussels, uh, quagga mussel, zebra mussel, Asian clam. Um, this is kind of a, just a funny comic that I found um, about zebra mussels. Uh, invertebrate, spiny water flea, and fish hook flea. So these are these are zooplankton. They're they're microorganisms um, that are are very hard to see, but survive in standing water. So um, and they they very uh, they impact the fisheries a lot. And then there's a virus, a fish virus, um, viral hemorrhagic septicemia. So these are all things that can that are it that are uh, well, it's a virus, but it's um things that can survive in standing water. So it's why we ask people to, to drain standing water and dry their boats between, um, between launch sites. So a little bit about zebra and quagga mussels. Um, they will just completely cover anything uh, in, in the water, docks, propellers, any, anything that stays in the water for, for a couple of months, um, we'll start to see uh, these guys growing on them. So we really want, we do not have any cases of zebra mussels or quagga mussels in Maine. So we're very much trying to keep it that way. So here's just a couple of pictures from, um, from other states. This is a, a nice little graphic of, of the spread of these zebra mussels. So the red is, is zebra mussel occurrences. Uh, and then we've got the other species that we're looking out for, but you can see it it started really in the Great Lakes region and has just spread out from there. So we're, we're really, um, it's probably luck so far that, that we don't have them here. And, and I think the boat inspectors, we really have an opportunity to, um, to make a difference here. So this is the, the, warning, the warning shot that we got, uh, I think that was last year or maybe the year before 
um, the folks from the Lakes Association of Norway will remember this clearly. Uh, there was a boat coming in actually in May and they had come, I believe, from the St. Lawrence River and they found this fragment of Eurasian milfoil on the person's, uh, on the person's boat. And so that was a big deal. Anyway, we only have Eurasian milfoil in a couple places in Maine. So that was, that was like, yay, we saved it. And then, um, I believe it was Karen who's on this call who noticed this tiny little zebra mussel growing on the stem of the Eurasian milfoil, which was just kind of shocking because in hindsight now, um, if that person had that on their boat, they, they could have had standing water in their boat. Maybe their boat was wet and they still had something on there. Zebra mussels can grow right on the boat. So it was kind of a wake up call and, and thinking that we need to start broadening our horizons as far as our message. There it is, little baby. All right, spiny water flea. This one really affects fisheries. Um, not a flea, it's a tiny little crustacean, feeds on zooplankton, um, can actually get stuck in the, in the throat of small fish um, so they, and kill them. So it's, uh, they're, they're pretty nasty and there's hundreds of them on that, on that fishing line. Um, and then that's the, the fish hook flea which is, you can see it has that spine on it. Um, so we, again, we do not have any instances of these in Maine yet, but th these are the kinds of things that, that are on the horizon we wanna look out for. The clean, drain, dry message. Um, this is a, something a lot of other states have been pushing for a while. Uh, in Maine, our state law is clean. So look for and remove hitchhiking plants, mud animals, and remove. Um, so our law is that you can't transport the plants. So it's kind of basic. Other states have drain as well as part of their state law. And that is um, that you drain any standing water from your boat. Uh, New Hampshire just passed this, I think two years ago, that you have to have your uh, any plugs out so that the water will drain and you have to have those plugs out between boat launches. And um, dry, dry is really hard. We want people to allow their boats to naturally dry between launch sites or wipe them down, but that is that is something that would be nearly impossible to um, to legislate because it's what if it rains, <laughs> um, and that's why their boat is wet. So that's um, that's a hard one. It's something we encourage, uh, but the clean and drain are, are the most important. So. Additional measures, uh, there are other places in other states that have wash stations. Um, we have a couple of boat wash uh, stations in our service area and probably some of you in your, at your boat launches as well. But it's usually just like a hose with cold water. Um, so other places have um, pressure washers, high heat water, um, and that really is, is for those organisms. Um, not not the plants so much, but those small bodied organisms can be killed with hot water. So um, we've talked about if we if it's feasible to have any of these kind of stations here in Maine, um, and uh, we haven't moved forward with that as of yet. But you can encourage somebody to go to a car wash. I have this. If anybody watches SpongeBob SquarePants, this is from SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> Um, but, uh, if somebody's boat or trailer is completely covered, uh, you can ask them to go to a car wash or, I mean, again, it's all courtesy. It's all voluntary, but, um, the boat inspector can certainly ask them to go to the nearest, um, wash station or, or car wash. All right. So what is the expectation when somebody is entering? If a boater is coming from out of state lake, they should be asked if their boat has been drained. And, and you can see, uh, often you can see if the, if the plug is out. I think many boaters do this anyway, especially when they're driving long distances. Um, having a bunch of standing water in your boat is kind of gross if you're going long distances, but we do ask if they have drained their boat. Um, 
if there is standing water, ask them to drive away from the launch and drain their boat. So that that's the thing. It, I mean, if they're right on your ramp, um, you do not want them to pull that plug and empty any um, any water, any standing water straight into your lake. So um, if they refuse to, to drive away, we don't want them to pull the plug and drain that water right into the lake. So, um, but sometimes they will kind of pull pull up to a different area so that that water won't drain into the lake. And then we can ask them to go to a car wash um, if that's feasible. I mean, some of you might have launches that are, are miles and miles away from the nearest um, car wash. So we can ask, um, but always politely and um, we shouldn't push, we shouldn't push um, boaters because we, we always want them to see that yellow shirt and say, oh good, somebody's here to help me with this boat inspection. We don't want them to dread <laughs> interacting with, a, with an inspector. Um, and then leaving. Um, after doing your inspection, uh, again, you should ask them to drive away, drain their boat, and just leave those plugs out as they're driving to the next, to the next um, launch site. And we always encourage them to do it after any water body, so not just yours. We should always be encouraging boaters um, to do these inspections themselves um, if there's no inspector on duty at their next place. So the greatest threat is boats that bounce from lake to lake. This is, um, I'm not putting them on the spot, but anglers, fishermen will often do um, different lakes every, every weekend to go fishing. And um, so they, uh, they will bounce from lake to lake quite a bit. And that's, it's hard. Five days of drying time is really hard. So that's why it's not something that's really being legislated. And then always remind the boater to put their plugs back in before launching, because that's um, a friendly reminder so that their boat doesn't fill with water. And then just some um, where we want to check. Uh, this is, this is going to be a little bit different for inspectors this year, because we are not doing anything on the inside of somebody's boat. Um, we're not, we're not even asking, can I reach inside your boat to, to touch any, we're not touching anything that, um, that they potentially have, have touched. Uh, so, and then with, with fishermen, again, we ask them to check their own fishing gear, anchors, um, waders, if they've got a net, if they have bait containers that might have standing water in them. Um, we don't want them to have pour their bait out, but we do want to ask them to um, not uh, pour any of that water out into this lake. So if they use up their bait and they have this bucket of water on their boat, we do not want them to dump that into our lake, um, wait until they're on land to do that. And then non-motorized craft, we inspect everything. So um, including canoes and kayaks, paddle boards, I had a sailboat one time. Um, anything that goes in the water can be suspect, and um, and we did. I I heard. I think it was Lovewell Pond one year had a um, had a kayak coming in. It had milfoil stuck to the side of the kayak, just suctioned right to the side of the kayak, and they had come from Lake Arrowhead. So um, having an awareness of where the infestations are in Maine is really important, um, and also just just inspect everything because you never know. Um, we don't want to make any assumptions that that something is going to be um, not a threat. And I think that's my, that's the quick slideshow. Um, we're going to be going over some other things and I'm going to show you the new training video uh, in a minute, but I didn't know if Karen, if we had any questions we needed answered now. Yeah, there were a couple um, summarized in here that came through. One person asked, um, and this went out to everyone on the chat, so anyone might have, everyone can see the questions. Um, the handbook, is that available online? And yes, it's at the LEA website and it's at DEP's website. And uh, Amanda from Rangeley posted uh, the DEP's website, so you can go check on that. 
And then also the boat registration, uh, there was a grace period. People did not have to register their boat. Um, however, John McFedrin pointed out that it, that grace period ended April 30th. Oh. So people, um, it doesn't appear that uh, the order was extended beyond the 30th. He did some research in the background. So um, people should be registered now. Okay. And that's all we have right now for Good. questions. Good. Yes, and and the thing with the um with the handbook, I, I will be sharing the link to that, and um and I'll probably share just the file so people can download it and um and print it if you want. It's it's in color. It it would probably take a lot to print it in color, but it um I do have a few more here at the office that I can mail out to people as well. So if you didn't get enough, or if you're new to the program and and would like one, I, I have a, a small handful that I can um, mail out to people. And didn't you include it in the uh, newsletter, a link to the handbook in the newsletter? You usually do. Probably. Okay. <laughs> but I am gonna do another one, another newsletter next week, which is gonna include the, the training video I'm about to show you, the slideshow I just did, um, Becky's slideshow, uh, and just, just information to get people started. I know, LEA where I work, our inspectors are starting on the 22nd next week. So um, I think other people start on Memorial Day weekend. So you'll have that, the, um, those materials for, uh, to share with your own folks. Okay. Okay. All right. So well, are we ready to move on to the next presentation? The video. All you right. do the video? Okay. That's next on my, on the agenda. Yay. Okay. okay. So before I do move on to sharing my screen, uh, a question came out um, about um, contaminated water bodies in the area. Um, we, the brochure that everyone got as a supply for the CBI shows where all the infested, infested main lakes are. If you want something in particular like a Let's see, um, a county listed by county. Becky, can sh can we do that? I will share the link to the ArcGIS online map that has all of the locations currently. Um, if you're talking about out of the state, um, no. we have that information, but we're not sharing that um, because it's really not ours to share. But yeah, so but in state, um, I'm about to send a link. Okay, and then, uh, uh, okay, everyone's got all these great questions. So, yes, we have a brochure, was created this year, and it is in the supply um, materials that were provided to your coordinator. Okay, Mary, uh, should I go ahead? Yes, I think I should. She's muted. Okay. Oh, I sorry. Will not be yes. able you should. It, I, I'm not sure where this technical difficulty is coming from, but I might get on the internet and share it that way because it is on YouTube. So, Okay, Let's I'm see. not going to be able to monitor the chat while I'm talking, so um, let me pull up my screen to share. Okay. All right. Okay. Can uh, Becky, can you see that? Just nod your head, yes, yeah. Okay, so DEP at the beginning of this whole COVID thing, whew, we were trying to decide as everybody what we would be able to do and what we wouldn't be able to do. And we decided with the CBI um, program that we needed to uh, request essential status because it is a very public facing type of operation. So that took, a while, but uh, we did eventually get uh, get essential status for the CBI pro programs, and then we developed a set of guidelines which we sent out. And now I have to try, and um, I'm going to share that. Let's see if I can do that. Can you see the guidelines? Did they come up for you, uh, Becky? Can you yes or no for me? Yes. No. Are my guidelines shared? They are now. Okay. All right. So basically, um, the first page of the guidelines for CBI uh, guidelines are the, the federal CDC set. So everyone who is doing um, CBI should be following at a minimum the CDC guidelines. And I had 
uh, the earlier picture I showed was a poster that came right from their website. And um, you can go look at their website and get that. So then, let's see, the next page is, okay. So we start off the guidelines by saying for the coordinators that we strongly recommend that all your inspectors use a face mask, hand sanitizer, and or gloves. And if you can, possibly provide them. But if not, most individuals at this point in America should have their own face mask. Um, DEP, we are not, we did not, we chose not to provide these because we didn't think we could get them. Um, we at the at DEP ourselves are having a hard time getting supplies. So, um, but we, we did say that you can use your grant funds to help purchase these uh, items. We also suggest that you provide your inspectors with dedicated supplies such as their own clipboard, their own pen and pencil, their own t-shirt and hat. Uh, very much you should be limiting sharing of these items between inspectors. Um, and then we strongly recommend using the CBI app for electronic data collection. This is a great way to limit the spread of uh, the virus because individuals, if they have their own app, they can enter the inspection data into their own personal smart device or you can also download this on the com uh, computer at home and enter the information after the fact. I won't go into more of this because Becky is here to help show you how to download onto your devices. So guidance for inspectors is of course, always maintain that physical distance of six feet. Be Mary's uh, video that she's struggling to get up online and show us um, demonstrates that uh, her fishing boat is a essentially six feet wide. So if you keep your boater on opposite sides of the boat of you, you should be all set. You should be wearing a face mask. Um, so Governor Mills Executive Order 49 requires a cloth face covering in public settings where you cannot maintain that physical distancing. Clean your hands often using hand sanitizer. It has to be contain about 60%, has to contain 60% alcohol or more. Um, someone uh, at a previous meeting I attended said, why can't we have someone put on uh, rubber gloves that have cotton lining, you can purchase those and then clean those after, with the alcohol. And I think that's a great idea if that would work for you. Um, remember that when you cough and sneeze and um, you should be doing it into a tissue or into your, um, your elbow. And then here's new for us this year, but Mary mentioned it. And again, it will be demonstrated in the video, but avoid touching any part of the boat trailer of equipment. And if you do end up touching something, then you always have the hand sanitizer available to you after, after the inspection. I would find it very hard to do. Mary has found it very hard to do not to lean up against the boat. We all tend to do that. So that may take some uh, learning on inspector's part. Again, do not, and then don't assist the boater with any part of the launching or retrieving. And you know, there are a lot, we're all very friendly. We wanna be very helpful, but um, do, not, do not assist in this because you'll end up touching their boat and getting too close. And then um, uh, greet your uh, boater from six feet away. Some people said, well, we'll ask the boater to stay in the car while we do the inspection. Um, that's, that might work for you. Or if the boater is out of the boat, um, you need to continue to maintain that physical distancing while wearing your face mask. And um, instead of handing out uh, our handouts, the brochure or the winch sticker, as we have always done in the past or offering them and handing them to the boater, um, we can still offer it to them, but there should be a station at the ramp where you have put up a box or a table with the material. So if the boater wants the information, such as the brochure, they can go and get it for themselves. Um, and then, uh, yep, Mary mentioned this, the draining, uh, pulling the drain on the boat, pulling the drain plug on the boat. 
you need to ask the boater to do that. Um, and when they're launching, you want to make sure they reinsert that plug, certainly. And when they're leaving, leave it out so it drains as they go over the road. But uh, you shouldn't be touching the drain plug. You should be asking the boater to do that. Again, leave the boater with an offer of a brochure or a winch sticker, but don't hand it to them. Um, have them go to the station where they are located. And finally, always use good judgment. If you do not feel that you can conduct the inspection while maintaining the physical distance or any of the other social protocols, then um, don't do the inspection. You can walk away. Um, you could always ask the inspector to do it, the, I mean the boater to do it themselves. And in the end, it really is your, um, you the inspector and even the boater, we want to protect your health at all costs. So that is the uh, guidance that we created and um, was sent out to every group uh, coordinator sent out in Mary's newsletter, everyone should have gotten it. And if you're a coordinator, you can share it with your inspectors. I, I, I'm gonna go to the chat now and see if there is anything there. What's the name of the new app? The app is the CBI mobile app. It's the same as the one that was last year. Um, and that's all I have. So I think I got it. Okay, I'll go um, mute. I now have it open in two places just in case it, I don't know. But um, I think that this is gonna work now and, and it'll illustrate um, what Karen just said. So, um, let's see, there we go. And Karen, I see you. So just let me know if you see this, just this video thumbs up. Is a guide for how to conduct the boat inspection within the restrictions set forth by Governor Mills during the COVID-19 pandemic. The goal is to prevent the spread of invasive species while keeping yourself and the boaters safe. Mary, I, yeah. uh, there it is. Yeah, we see it. Never mind. Okay, I'm starting uh, But again. your voice is very, uh, very soft. It's okay. hard to hear. Okay, I'll, um, maybe I'll turn up the sound on my computer and see what that does. Stand by. This video is a guide for how to conduct the boat inspection within the restrictions set forth by Governor Mills during Better. the COVID-19 pandemic. The goal is to prevent the spread of invasive species while keeping yourself and the boaters safe. Always maintain a physical distance of at least six feet. Wear a cloth face covering during inspection. Clean your hands or use hand sanitizer often. Avoid touching any part of the boat, trailer, or other equipment. Do not assist boater with any part of launching or retrieving their watercraft. And do not hand the boater brochures, stickers, or other materials. Only wear a cloth mask when interacting with anyone at the boat ramp. Have your mask in place before approaching the boater. How are you doing today? Great, how are you? I am doing very well. I was hoping it, uh, to do an inspection of your boat and trailer for aquatic plants. I'm in a hurry, can it be quick? It can be really quick, just a few minutes. That's fine then. Great, uh, can you help me maintain the social distancing uh, at least six feet? Sure. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start at the front of the boat and uh, if you could just come back here and pull the plug to drain any standing water, that would be great. Okay. Try to maintain at least six feet of physical distance at all times. Invasive animals, such as beaver mussels, can survive in standing water, so always encourage the boater to pull any drain plug. What was the last lake you were on? I went fishing on Lake Arrowhead last week. All right, um, thank you. I'm gonna try and touch the boat as little as possible. So if you could check your anchor and fishing gear, that would be great. Okay. Thank you.
found a plant on my anchor. What should I do with it? Oh, if you could just put it on that table over there, that would be great. I will get it identified later. Um, Lake Arrowhead does have invasive milk oil, so it's really good that we're doing this today and, and we'll get that plant identified. Feel free to um, grab a brochure and a sticker while you're over there. Do not hand anything to the voter. Have a designated area with a table or box where voters can leave plants or pick up informational material. Be mindful not to touch the boat or trailer during the inspection. It can be difficult to remember this, but it is an important step in keeping yourself and the boater safe. Remember that any part of the boat or trailer that goes in the water can catch plants. So make sure you visually inspect all parts of the trailer, including the carpeted bunk, wheel well, and license plate. Leave the inside of the boat to the boater, but make sure you do a thorough inspection of the motor and propeller. Uh, I found a plant in your propeller. Uh, do you mind if I just remove that? No, that's fine. Always ask the voter if you can remove any plants. If they say no or you are not comfortable, please ask them to do so themselves. If a voter refuses inspection, respectfully ask them to do it, offering to walk them through the process. You can also offer them an inspected lake brochure for more information. The winch stickers are designed to go on the trailer and remind voters to clean, train, and dry their boats when an inspector is not at the launch site to help. Your help today. Um, if there isn't an inspector the next time you go out, would you be able to do that inspection yourself? Sure, I can do that. Great, thank you. Uh, have a great day out on the water. Thank you. After the boater has left, gather any plant fragments into a sample bag to submit for identification later. When the inspection is complete, use hand sanitizer to remove any contaminants you may have inadvertently picked up during the interaction. Be sure you do this before touching anything, including any writing utensils, clipboard, or most importantly, before removing your mask. After your hands are clean, complete your inspection either on the paper form or on the mobile app. Boat inspections are essential to keeping our lakes free from invasive aquatic species. Thank you for helping us keep our lakes and each other healthy. Okay, so there's that. Um, that is certainly something that you, I would encourage people to share with their inspectors. I think some people are, um, are having a hard time visualizing what this is going to look like. So I think that that might be helpful. I also, um, I think of it cause some people are saying, well, if both people aren't wearing masks, it's not, it's not as effective, which is true. But I, I see the mask also as a deterrent. So it might not be um, fantastic at, at uh, preventing the spread of the virus, although it, it does something. Um, it also shows the voter, it reminds the voter um, not to approach you. Um, I, I think it's a really good, a good reminder of that. Uh, where if both people are unmasked, people might just fall back into the normal roles that we've always always had at the, at the boat launch. Um, because I know that there are some inspectors that historically will shake their hands and, and, and will go over and, and greet them personally. And, and we need to make sure that, that this year uh, we do everything we can to keep at least that, that six feet distance. Uh, so 
Uh, should we wait for questions? Yeah, yeah, I've got a, um, I have a few questions lining up here, folks. It's, <laughs> it's a bit challenging. So John McFedrin, if you do see something I missed, be my guest and address it. Um, uh, Tamara Whitmore from the Friends of Copsey Watershed has a pretty cool post. She uh, suggests using a tool. You guys can look at that if you're interested for picking up hanging plants and it acts as a great physical distance prompt too. <laughs> I could just envision that. Thank you, Tamara. Um, so let's see, someone asked, well, our ramp is also a picnic and swim area. Is there any guidance for uh, those type of activities? And I would just say you'd have to go and look at the main CDC website and the governor's recommendation or the governor's guidance um, there. There's nothing specific like we did for the CBI. And let's see a couple of uh, kudos to you, Mary, for the great video. And then someone asked about the bass tournaments. Well, you know, I, I didn't think to mention this anywhere yet, but there are no bass tournaments this year. Uh, IFNW has not issued any uh, permits, so there are no official bass tournaments. That's not to say bass clubs will not be out there, but they are not conducting a tournament. So... Um, there are no tournaments. And then let's see, the pictures of the plants. So uh, plants are, any sus anything that is suspicious should be sent to the Lake Stewards of Maine. And Mary is going to address that later in this presentation, so I won't say any more. And, Karen, um, Linda Mary, Rice. Uh, wait a minute, Mary shared the link to the um, video and um, uh, and then there's going to, there are more questions that will be addressed later on in this presentation. Becky, what did you say? Um, further back, Linda Rice asked about the brochures, the new brochures, and I was wondering if they had been distrib distributed this year. Yeah. yeah, and I thought I had address that. Yes, the brochures are in the CBI supply kit that is supplied to your coordinator, Linda, and everybody. Yes, Karen, you answered that earlier. Thanks. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that is it for comments um, in the chat box. So, Mary, Becky, Becky, it's you. You're up now. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, Karen, I, just one thing um, about brochures and stickers, I still have some at the office. So if people haven't, um, I, I also put uh, five or six packages in the mail out to organizations this week. So um, if, if you need more, we have more and we can mail those out. Um, I, I have no idea how many voters are gonna be wanting to take materials. So we're just gonna play that by ear, but we have more if you need more. Um, it's a great turnout. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, my email address is on here and uh, please contact me if you run into any issues. Everyone has a different setup, um, different browsers, different devices, different computers. Uh, so there's a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one help that's needed sometimes. Um, and I am checking my work email on most weekends. So if anything does come up, um, I can usually answer pretty quickly. All right, so in this demo, I'm going to show you how to download and install uh, in two parts the Survey123 app and the CBI survey for 2020 on a phone, tablet, or computer. And then Mary's going to follow up with how to actually enter data on the survey and submit it. And um, again, any questions you have, I can't see the chat screen right now, so just um, type in your questions uh, and um, I'll get to them after. I'm done with the presentation. Uh, okay. So um, benefits quickly of the using the app. Um, last year we realized that while well, people were actually using the app in the dock, um, about half of you were using computers at home to enter the data after their shifts were over. Uh, and this is actually a great way to use, use the app. Uh, it allows you to continue to use the paper survey forms 
uh, if you'd like to and have the you know the paper trail but it also allows the data to be uploaded almost immediately to the cloud and from there we can make it um, accessible um, accessible to everyone you don't need a cell or wi-fi connection while you're at the launch site um, <clears throat> the uh, data is stored right on your phone and um, and then you can upload it at a later time you can also save drafts if you're in the middle of filling out an inspection form and then you get interrupted you can save it come back to it at a later time uh, and as i said before the data gets uploaded immediately to the cloud so it's a good thing to have Okay, so for those of you who used the app last year, um, I highly recommend deleting it and re-downloading because um, the current version, I think, is 3.9.148 or maybe even a little later. Um, and if last year you remember, anytime there was an update to the app that was critical, I would have to reach out and contact all of the coordinators and ask you to have everyone delete the uh, survey and re-upload it and it was it was um, kind of a hassle for everyone. Now, starting with this new version, uh, you are notified immediately if there are any updates to the surveys. There's a bar at the top of the screen um, when you open the app, and all you need to do is click on that, and it'll take you to another screen uh, where you can refresh the survey, so you're not deleting anything. Um, if you're new to this this year, then this is the this is the uh, version that you're getting automatically, so you should be all set. All right, so as I said, this is a two-step process. Uh, Survey123 is um, created by a company called Esri, and it, I have no control over the programming of it. I don't know how it works behind the scenes, um, but this is the app that you install um, to get the CVI survey up and running on your device. So to put it on a phone or a tablet, uh, it's just like any other app. You go into the app store for your device. So for Android, that's usually the Google Play Store. Uh, for Apple, it's the App Store. And you can search for Survey123. I think the full name of the app is Survey123 for ArcGIS, but it, it just comes up if you type in Survey123. Then you choose Install and um, it downloads and opens up. So when it opens, uh, you'll see this green screen here um, and it will probably say sign in at the bottom or sign in to get surveys and you don't need to do that. Um, you, just, you can just stop here, you can close the app and then go on, uh, <clears throat> go on to the next step. Um, but before we get there, um, if you want to install Survey123 on your computer, uh, that's absolutely fine too. So the quickest way to do that is to Google get survey123 or go to the link shown here. And that link is provided in the instructions that have been sent out. Um, or if you didn't get those, let me know and I can send, send those. So clicking on that link brings you to this survey123 for ArcGIS webpage. And um, so from the center column there, under where it says survey123 field app, uh, you're going to select the appropriate installation file for your computer's operating system. So um, Mac OS obviously for, is for Apple products, um, and then there are two Windows um, installation files. And um, so one of those is for 64-bit computers, and one of them is for 32-bit computers. So you will need to know that. You'll need to um, determine which operating system you have, have to um, download the appropriate file. And once you've determined that, uh, click on the correct link. It, the file will download to your computer. Then you need to find that download and double click it to install the program. And again, like it's like installing any other program on your computer, just follow the instructions provided in the, uh, in the wizard. <clears throat> Okay, so um, again, once you've installed on your computer, uh, I recommend open it up, make sure the, app, the, uh, the program works for you, but you don't need to sign in. 
So now we're going on to step two of the installation process, and that's downloading the actual CBI survey form. And I do offer that. I do create that um, using a standard called XLS forms, um, if anyone is interested. Uh, and so I have more control over the survey form. Uh, so if there are issues with that, problems that you run across while using it, just let me know. And um, you know we can try to address them. So there are two basic ways. Um, hold on a second. Okay, so there are two uh, basic methods for getting the CBI survey form. Um, method one, and this would be for either a computer or a phone, uh, open a browser, like Safari or Chrome on your device and type in uh, this link. Uh, and you can skip the HTTPS portion. You can just type in bit.ly slash main CBI 2020. And that's a shortcut um, for the actual web address of the survey link. Um, but it, it's easier to remember that way. You also, if you get uh, an email or if you're looking at the PDF of the instructions, which contains that link, you can just click on it and it will open, should open a browser. Okay, I know some people have had issues with uh, Safari recently. Um, I recommend just, if you do have issues with one browser, try a different one. Um, <clears throat> other than that, contact me and we can try and try and work through the problems. All right, the second method, and this is quicker for, for some people if you're using a phone or a tablet, most newer phones have built-in QR readers in their camera apps. So all you have to do is open the camera, um, point it at the QR code below, and um, you should see a pop-up on your screen that says something like open Arc GIS in, in a browser in Safari, and then you click on that link. Either of those two methods, uh, either of those two methods will bring you to a web page that looks like the screen cap on the right here. Um, it should have a survey123.rts.com address, and it will say open in the survey123 field app. So if you click on that, you should get this pop-up box. Again, asking open the survey123, click open again. If you don't see any extra pop-ups that come up, you might have uh, like a pop-up blocker on your, on your browser. So try turning that off um, before trying to install the app or you can try a different browser. Okay, um, again, this only applies to anyone who has a Survey123 on their um, device from last year. And you, if you don't wanna get rid of it for whatever reason, that's fine. Um, again, we do highly recommend updating uh, to the latest version. But if it turns out that you do need to, um, um, sorry, someone's coming to my front door and I'm not sure who it is. Uh, if you do need to delete the existing survey, you open up Survey123, you click on the CBI 2020, or 20, yeah. Uh, well, if you have the CBI 2019 survey on, survey on there, you're going to want to delete that anyway. But the way you delete is you click on the three horizontal bars up in the top right and click Delete Survey. Then you just return to that um, shortcut link, the main CBI 2020 link, and uh, re-download. Okay. So then, uh, once you've installed both the app and the survey, um, open them up to check check out they're working correctly. Uh, if you see what you know, if you see this screen, then you are ready to. Um, hit collect and start collecting the data. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, Mary was gonna run through actually how to use the, the CBI app. Um, you are welcome to try and test it out. Uh, if you do wanna test, fill out some data and submit it, I ask you that you just enter test in the comments box at the end. And so that way I'll know that I can delete that later on. And that's about it for that. So if there are any questions, I'm gonna try and see the sh chat screen again.
Yeah, there are some specific questions for you, Becky, so that would be great. I didn't want to, I didn't dare attempt to answer them. Um, okay, yep, here we go. Um, yeah, so the app is, is asking to sign, asking you to sign in, that's by default, but um, you don't need to, you should, um, <laughs> Once you click on that main CBI 2020 link or go to it uh, and you see that green screen that says open the survey one, two, three, you click on that, it should download and unpack the survey. So it should be accessible without signing in. Um, if that's not happening, um, please send me a quick email. Um, that would be a settings issue. Okay, you said it's okay now. Um, can you install the app twice? Yes, you can. Uh, it's, a, it's a public survey, but it's anonymous, so it doesn't capture any information about you, your name, or anything. Um, and so you can have it on as many um, things as you want. I have it on a phone, two tablets, and two computers, and I don't know even anymore where it is. Um, and if inspectors use the app, do you need to keep hard copies on file? That's up to the coordinator. So check with your coordinator about that. Uh, oh, another thing I'm going to be showing later is something called a dashboard, and that um, is actually displaying the data that's been captured, and um, you'll see how quick it is, how quick it gets up into the cloud and can be displayed. And there's one more question in the chat box for you, Becky. How do we get our inspectors to be able to use the QR code? Um, yes, there was a couple of PDFs that were sent out. Um, <clears throat> with the instructions, and those are for distribution to your inspectors, and that in, uh, set of instructions has the QR code in it. And you have another question. Okay, um, yep, yeah, you use Survey123 for Lake Smart. Uh, we're actually going to be recommending the same upgrade process for Lake Smart um, because we do have all the data from that saved already. So um, you can, yeah, you can delete the 2019 CBI survey um, by that, um, the three horizontal bars up in the top right corner, it's the menu, click on that when you're in the click screen and uh, delete the survey. And I think it's worth mentioning, Becky, you did create the uh, Lake Smart app also, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it might look familiar to you folks. Becky did both. <laughs> And there's another question. What does what ramp mean? That's the ramp for the lake. So each lake has a ramp name, um, ramp that has been named. So if you picked, for instance, uh, Sebago Lake, uh, I mean, yeah, Sebago Lake for the group that's doing the inspections, say it's LEA, it's gonna show um, the state park ramp. That's what ramp means. And I'm gonna cover that, Karen. Okay. In just a minute. So good. Yeah. All right. I think we're good. So thank you very much, Becky. That's awesome. And that is all going to be available to you guys if it isn't already. And we'll move on to Mary, who's going to actually enter some data into the app. Thanks, Mary. That's the plan. So uh, my first, make sure I'm unmuted. Yes. Uh, the first thing I'm going to share is actually a picture of the inspection form. Um, many of my inspectors, especially the retired folks, are going to be filling out the inspection form, the paper form at the launch, bringing it home and entering it on their computers at home um, or, or entering it on their phone at the launch, but they wanted to write it down and have that written copy so that they could then copy it into, into the app. So I'm going to show you the paper form and, and most of you, this will just be review, but I think there are some new people that have never seen this before. So let's hope it works the first time. There she is. All right, so I just filled this out this morning, um, just going through uh, the, the basic parts. Um, up at the top, we've got number of trailers present when um, upon shift arrival. So we have, we've got the, the story from Toddy Pond about an inspector that um, 
got to the ramp and and there was a trailer in the in the lot they had already launched and it had Eurasian milfoil on it. So we always check trailers when we start our shifts, uh, just just in case, um, just in case there's something on there. And you can write down the, the license plate number in the comments and, and um, collect plant samples and, and talk to the voter once they come out. Um, so lake name, uh, ramp name, it, some lakes have multiple ramps. So that's why we really need to know which one they're at. And then the town, date, uh, ship time, everything's in military time. So there's that. And then the, sh the inspector name. I also pre-fill a couple of things, so uh, I do have a fillable PDF of this document if, um, if you would like one. I'm going to send it out uh, in the newsletter as a link anyway, so if anybody wants to pre-fill some of those top, that top section, uh, you'll be able to do that. So just, I put down two, two inspections in here, um, motorized boats, you need to put down the bow number. So state abbreviation, um, and it should be right on the right on the side of the boat. State abbreviation, and then the um, the entire alphanumeric number on the side, um, and that should be letters and numbers. So if an inspector is writing down a long string of just numbers, they're probably writing down the number on the river and lake protection sticker, which is not the registration number. So this should be the registration number. Every once in a while, a boat will not have their decals on the boat yet. Uh, and usually we would ask to see their registration, but since we're not asking them to hand us any documents, um, just let it go. We are not enforcement. So if they're not registered, that's their deal if they get in trouble for it. Um, so this is a way to kind of keep track of what boats you've checked. Uh, and um, so, it's not an absolute requirement though. So if they don't have those numbers on the side of the boat, just let it go. Uh, you answer whether or not they have the current sticker. So again, this year it is red. So yes or no, and then NM is non-motorized. So canoes, kayaks, paddle boards are not required to have the river and lake protection sticker. So um, you can circle that. And then we ask, where were you last? And uh, Sebago Lake has milfoil. And uh, so if you, kn if you know the lakes in Maine that, that have invasive species, you can kind of do a more thorough inspection. Any boater coming from out of state, uh, if their previous water body was an out of state lake, we treat that as suspicious um, because other New England states and, and states around the country have much higher rates of infested lakes than us. So we always treat those as suspicious. Um, Town and state, town to the best of their ability. Uh, some people won't remember where the, what the town ramp was, but again, um, as much information as you can get. And then time of inspection, again, that is in military time, any plants found, yes or no. And then I did do another one that was non-motorized. Um, doesn't matter, you don't have to write down that it was a kayak or canoe or whatever. Um, so previous water body, this person was leaving and I did put down that plants were found. And um, if plants are found, you have to answer the question, was it identified as invasive or not? Some inspectors will be able to have some rudimentary plant skills and they'll be able to, to tell if some grass is not invasive, but a lot of inspectors don't have a lot of knowledge so they will need to submit a sample, a plant sample. And I'll go through kind of the, the procedure for that in a little bit. So that is the inspection form. Um, it is in the handbook. So uh, you can get copies of it that way. And I'm also gonna just send out a PDF of this um, so that you can make copies for your inspectors if you want. And I will say, um, I did this in pencil, not that you can tell that at all from this picture, but I did do it in pencil. And my plan is to, once I enter the data and send it to the DEP, I um, will erase the, the, uh, the form so that I can reuse it. Because one of the great things about the app is reducing our paper waste. So being able to reuse the forms, I think, is, is important.
I'm going to stop the share and it looks like we've got several questions. Or should I share it again? What, Karen, what's, what's happening over here? Unmute. I'm unmuted now. Okay. okay. Um, let's see, if you find a plant and don't use a hard copy form, how do you hold that inspection information until you get the response on the plant being invasive of not? So you're just um, in the app, and Mary's going to demonstrate this. The app shows how to do that. So I'm not going to try to explain it. It's addressed in the next presentation. Did you want to add anything to that, Mary? No, I think I think it kind of explains it in the when I okay. fill out the app. I think that'll that'll okay. help with that. And um, Becky, uh, they ask someone asked for the URL for the uh, ArcGIS form again. Um, yeah, you? I just posted it. Okay. So that's posted. It's in the and chat. And I think that's it right now. And all of that, everything will will go out in um, in an, uh, in a newsletter next week. So okay. all of these links and stuff. I know people probably want to get going as, as quickly as possible. So, um, but all those links and things will be. You'll see. Okay. Them. So all I right. think we're ready for your demonstration on the app, Mary. Yes. Okay. So I, um, I like to use the app on my computer, and I think a lot of people are going to go that route. It's really nice because you can use your full keyboard and you can use your mouse to, to navigate around. Some of the kids on my, um, on my crew are totally comfortable doing it right on their phone at the, at the launch, and they're, they're versed in that, but some of my, the retired folks are... Um, their fingers, they, they're like, my fingers just don't work very well on the phone. So they're going to bring it home. So that's what I'm sharing with you now is what it looks like on a computer. Maybe. Takes a little while. There we go. Is that showing, Karen? Nod your head if that's showing. All right. So, um, I like to maximize it. Oh. So I just have the one. Um, so I'm going to continue without the update. So this is a really nice, it is a nice feature that every time there's an update, it'll, it'll tell me about it. Um, but you can continue without updating. Um, I think, I'll, well, we can ask Becky this, but I think a lot of the updates are um, people adding their inspector names, and I'll show you what that means in a second. So I'm gonna just enter the data that I just took, that I just showed you. So you hit collect. And load. forgot about how my computer is slow. So I, I can open it as quickly as I, as I want. So um, date is a nice little calendar there. Um, visit date, so you can, you can change that date um, if it's different than, um, like, yeah, you can change that. And then in agency, Everybody's in here automatically. Anybody that's been submitting data, um, you can start typing your group, IMLEA. And then it's nice, it's got this drop down. So you can do this with agency two. It's got a drop down, and you can scroll down through your list of ramps. I'm not sure any group has as many ramps as me, but um, so you might just have one under your uh, group name but I've got a bunch. So Hancock Pond, and it's got this cool map feature where it'll actually drop a pin for where that ramp is located. And inspector name. So again, if you have given a list to Karen, um, your inspectors will be preloaded in here. Um, and you can put other or new inspector. So if, you, if they're not in there, 
you can click on that and type them in. But um, this is a really, it's a really nice feature. So I'm gonna click myself. I am paid. Um, my shift time was, you do have to do the zero, zero seven hundred. Um, I had two trailers. And then once you've filled out, so that's representing that top line of the inspection form is now filled out and then you move on to actually doing inspections. Every once in a while, you'll have a shift where you don't have any boats. It's very boring, but um, it happens. So even if you didn't have any boats, you still wanna submit the, the form. So uh, you would just click no, you didn't have any, but it, it registers that you were there that day. Um, but we did do some. So you click yes, and then you do the plus mark to add an inspection. Um, I'm not going to use the current time. So a lot of, if you're entering this at home after the fact, you're not going to be using the, the current time. It's nice if you do it at the launch on your phone, you, you don't have to, you can just say, yeah, I'm using the current time and it will register that automatically. Um, so it was 735. The boat is motorized. They did have the current sticker. Um, when you start typing in, um, the state of Maine. So you, again, there's a drop down and you can scroll through that, but it's really nice because you can just type in an M and Maine will come up first. So uh, that's a nice thing. You can type in the name or just a letter and it will give you, give you the, the list. Um, bow number 542. Okay. And their last water body was was in Maine it wasn't this is a really nice feature for those of you that did it last year you can click same as current water body because a lot of times people are like I only boat in this lake so you can just click on that and it will pre-fill the rest of the information but these people were on Sebago Lake and and you can see how this is interesting the bold is infested lakes are bolded um, but if anybody, I, I think Pam is here from Little Sebago Lake, and Little Sebago Lake technically does have milfoil. So maybe we should bold Little Sebago Lake. But anyway, yep. they were on Sebago Lake. Um, and they were in Casco Launch um, entering. No plants found. And then um, this is a, a nice feature as well. You can view list of inspections if you click I see yes. see everybody, but I don't have the screen anymore. What? Sorry, Carolyn, did, what did you say? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I will unmute myself. I just got the screen back on. Thanks. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so this is a nice feature. It has the list of inspections. So as you enter, um, I, I think this is especially nice for people that are entering from an inspection form at home, because um, you can then go back through and see, make sure that you have done them all. Uh, but we did have another inspection. If, the, if you just had the one inspection, you click this arrow at the very bottom of the screen that will take you to the end of your shift. But we did have one more. So I'm gonna click that. I'm going to put the time in that that kayak came through. It is not motorized. Um, it was the same water body. And see how it, it's cool because it, it um, pre-fills that information. And they were leaving and there was a plant found. So when there's a plant found, uh, we have some additional information that shows up. So it's got a little direction, invasive plant must be ID'd by Lake Stewards of Maine or DEP, and um, all suspicious plants should be sent to Lake Stewards of Maine for verification and um, keep the plant in a cool place. So uh, you can say, yes, it was verified by an expert. Um, no, it wasn't invasive. So that's just a simple no, or I don't know. And I, this might happen quite a bit. So if at the launch, they, they don't know if the plant is invasive or not, um, they need to submit it for identification 
and you can see it says who did you give the plant or photo to for ID. Um, the inspectors that I employ, I just told them yesterday, our protocol is going to be that they collect the plant sample, they keep it in a bag, and they send me photos of it. Um, and if I look at it and I say, well, this is suspicious to me, I'm going to ask them to bring the plant, the physical plant sample in. But we're going to try and do photo ID first. And um, the Lake Stewards of Maine has um, a place on their website where you can submit photos to them, which I will show you in just, in just a little bit. Um, but my folks are going to say that they submitted it to the Lake Association, which is me. Um, it tells you how many inspections you've uh, entered. So the inspections are listed at the bottom here and, um, and then we're done. So if you have more, click plus, you enter more. Uh, if not, you go to the third page. Our shift time ended at 11. Um, when did you complete this form? So during shift or after. And then I am putting test in the comments um, because Becky asked me to do that so that she knows that these weren't real inspections. Um, the comments section should, this is going directly to the DEP. So it shouldn't be, I remember checking inspection forms that the, the uh, comments section used to have very random, like here's how the loon population is doing in the comments section. That is not appropriate for the comments section. So I'm putting test, I do a check mark, um, survey completed, send now, continue the survey, or save the survey in the outbox. Um, so I'm just going to send it now. I, it could be something where you ask your inspectors to save that survey until you know if that plant has been verified or not. That's going to be something that each coordinator has to decide. Um, so I sent it, and there it is. And it has it has um, a list of the ones that I have sent in in my box here. So that is entering the that's entering the data. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I I think it's um. I think it's fairly simple, especially on the computer. Um, I think at the launch, some people might get a little overwhelmed um, using at the launch. It also, if you're on a long shift, you don't want you could die. So I think it's. Um, it's good to have the paper forms with you no matter what, just in case to, to back yourself up. But yeah, once, once it's sent, you can erase your form and reuse it. So, well, or if people are more, if coordinators are more comfortable keeping hard copies, you can do, you can do that too. I mean, there's, um, I think different organizations are going to choose to do things a little bit differently. Um, and Karen, I did have a question from somebody about using the Excel form. Um, you did. Okay. So, uh, I don't see it. It's not on here. It was on the phone. <laughs> but the Excel um, form is still available if people want to use it. Um, we're really trying to push the um, app. Really, really trying to push the app. Yeah. We're really trying. To, the, yeah, but but there are um, the <laughs> there's there's exceptions. I mean, there's there's um, there you might have folks that don't have a smart device. And there's one person I talked to yesterday that they don't have power. <laughs> They're off the grid. Uh, so there's going to be situations where people are not, not going to be able to use the app for whatever reason. Uh, so those of you that did it last year, um, there was an Excel form that the coordinator could use to, to enter the data and send it to Karen electronically. But using the app is easier. <laughs> so okay. I would suggest that. Okay, so um, a couple of questions. Oh boy. Um, someone asked about an iNaturalist page for invasives to upload photos for ID by the appropriate representative. I'm not familiar with one. Someone may, uh, uh, John might have some information, but our handbook has the invasive plants that are listed as invasive in the state of Maine. It's in the back of the CBI handbook, as well as a few additional species of concern. So it's in the handbook. Um, can we share the survey with our coordinators? Uh, we're gonna get into that. Becky's gonna talk about the dashboard. You'll get to see what is visible to everybody. How do you send the data? Uh, 
I don't, I'm not sure of that question. Um, so, I don't know if I can go back easily. So it there's just um it's just a it just says send. Yeah. 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 You'll have to explore it, but it is a button at the bottom of the app. Yeah. So now we're at 30 minutes out to when we are going to shut down automatically. So I think we need to move on. If I didn't address your questions, you can always email us um, individually uh, or repeat the question in the chat because I, I, I'm sure I'm missing a few here. And John McFedrin my, um, with the DEP Invasive Group, he's helping me screen and his response is a very full, very full of information. Okay, um, next is questions about collecting. And Becky, I think you're up to do the dashboard, right? Mary, am I correct? Yeah. There you go. I can do that. Let me share this. What am I doing here? Um, Sorry, I have to switch to it first. Um, so how do you make sure that the inspectors are actually filling in the form? Well, like Mary said, that you can have them fill the form in and then enter the data later, send you the form, or um, Becky's gonna show you the dashboard, which is created once the data is sent up into the cloud. So take it away, Becky. Okay, so this um, this is what we're calling a dashboard. It's um, essentially a collection of different pieces of the data displayed in different ways so that you can get a quick, um, quick view of what's been submitted uh, by your inspectors. And um, so, you know, the main thing is that there's this map showing where uh, shift information has been submitted from. Uh, right now I have it symbolized so that the blue dots are actual inspections. Uh, we have some real early birds um, up there uh, submitting data already, which is great. And then uh, we've got some test data. The, the red squares are um, test data that's been submitted. So, you know, the, those, aren't, <clears throat> those aren't real inspections. Now, what the Quickest way to start digging down into the data is to select um, an organization from the list here. Go LEA. And once you do that, you'll notice that it filters out the information, uh, it filters out the um, squares that correspond to the LEA inspections. And then you can further drill down uh, in the select by slight site dropdown. So we'll do that one. And again, it's filtering. And then finally, you can also select by date. And so you'll only see information in these drop-down boxes. Um, it's it's responsive to what you've uh, entered in the in the organization in the site. So these all play off each other to um, make it easy to see only the data that you want to see. All right. Uh, so. In addition to the map being filtered when you, when you select from the drop downs, the information over here on the right will be filtered too. And so uh, quickly what you're seeing is the number of shifts, the number of inspections done during those shifts, um, <clears throat> total hours, uh, both paid and volunteer. And then if there are invasive plants, you'll see a notification of how many plants found out of how many plants um, how many invasive plants found out of how many total plants. Then you've got some information on each shift and in inspection. So you can see that the number 18 here corresponds with the number eight, 1 to 18 here. So you can scroll through those. They're sorted by date and time right now. Um, and then the same with inspection details, they're sorted by time, date and time. You can just scroll through those and the information you can see, uh, organization, ramp, 
uh, inspector ID number instead of their name. We're, we're not, you know, publicizing any names or um, vote registration information, anything like that. Uh, so if you're a coordinator, just contact me for the list of um, inspector IDs so that you know who they belong to, who they belong to. Uh, inspection time, whether, whether the boat was motorized and had a sticker, where it was registered, um, and the last um, town and state where the boat was launched. Also, whether invasive plants were found on it. And then over here on the right, uh, it's a synopsis of the last water body launched. It's only going to show the um, top 40 by total count. Um, and you can scroll down that list to see. If you hover over a bar, it'll tell you how many uh, um, uh, visits to that lake occurred. <clears throat> and then there's registration state. Similar idea, you hover over it. So there were 33 boats registered in Maine that visited four from Massachusetts. And again, this is dummy data, so these aren't necessarily true numbers right now. <clears throat> and then I am trying to decide right now whether to use the pie graph or a similar column bar graph for the registration state, but it's the same information in this and this. So I will probably decide on one of them and remove the other. All right, so as I said, everything gets filtered when you start choosing from these boxes. So LEA, you notice that numbers have all changed so that you're only seeing LEA's information. Drill down further, Denmark ramp, uh, one shift with no inspections, and then that one date. So this is going to be, this link is not public yet, but it's going to be sent out to all of the coordinators um, and this will give you a lot of the information you need for your um, your reporting. Uh, but if you need um, more detailed information, if you want an Excel form or whatever of uh, the rest of the rest of the details, um, right now we don't have a great way for you to log in and see that information. But you can always contact me. I can export the data for you uh, pretty quickly and get that sent out. So hopefully this will help with a lot of your reporting needs. Okay, so let's see if there's any questions about that. Um, <clears throat> the login, there's no login for the dashboard when it's made public. Right now it's not, but um, eventually it will be, it will be accessible to everyone. Uh, and a vote for a pie graph, okay. Last page of app. Um, is there a way to know who the shift person inspector is if they did not see any boats? Um, but again, there's a inspector ID code, which I can provide to coordinators. And was there a symbol to indicate infested lake launches last year? We didn't have that. We had um, a special symbol for any invasive plants that were found during an inspection. And Sarah Levine um, wants to go back to the last page of the application and show how to finish the data entry and send it off. Uh, I'll, I can do that quick. Is that okay, Karen? Sure. Yep. All right. So I'm going to share my survey one, two, three. <clears throat> All right, is everyone seeing my survey123? Yes. Okay. It's loading right now. <clears throat> there yeah. you go. All right, so let me fill in some stuff real quick here. It's worth mentioning some of these items are required. And if you forget to do it, you'll be reminded. And military time, uh, uh, is in the CBI, new, uh, CBI 
handbook. So you can look it up there if you don't know your military time, which most people don't. Okay, so I just skipped over the inspection portion just to, to do this real quick. But once you've come to the end here and you're pretty sure you've filled everything out, um, then there's a check mark down in the bottom right. And, oh, so I forgot something. So it tells me, it takes me back to where I need to fix that. Click the check mark again. Then it asks, it says survey is completed and your device is online. Um, if you're at a, a boat launch and you don't have a signal, it'll say your device is offline and your options will be to save the survey in the out box. Uh, that you won't see the send now option. But I do have send now, which would just finish this up and send it immediately to the cloud. Or if I need to go back and fix something, I can do continue the survey. It just closes that box and takes me back into the survey. Or finally, um, save the survey in the out box, and that's you know saving a completed but not sent survey. And that is something you'll need to do is check that there isn't anything in your outbox um, when you are back within Wi-Fi signal cell range. And if there is, uh, you can click on that and send. Beautiful, thank you. So hopefully that answers the questions. Okay, yeah, I don't see any more new questions. So now let's move on, we've got 20 minutes. Let's move on to Mary is gonna talk about how to deal with suspicious plants because this year with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, LSM, Lake Stewards of Maine, which is where you send your suspicious plants, is not, uh, they don't want, they want to receive live plants unless they have to. So there's a really good page on their website that explains how to send a picture. So Mary, you're up. Yes. Um, I also, really quick, I wanted to address, I don't remember who said it, um, asking about how how can you know that your inspector is filling out the forms? Um, I, I I thought about that as a, from a cynical point of view, and I think maybe they meant like how do you know they're actually doing it? Um, anybody any I did this. I filled out this form this morning. I was not actually doing inspections. Um, anybody can sit down with the app at any place and and fill it out. Um, so you have to spy on them is the, is the short <laughs> answer. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if you're, if you're wondering, if you, if you don't know if they're, if they're doing it, um, whether it's the old fashioned way with the inspection forms or on the app, you, you have to, you have to spy on them in order to make sure that they're there. Um, which is sad, but it is I, what it is. I, I have to say Mary with LEA deals with, dozens of inspectors and they had an incident um, several years ago now where they actually caught someone who was just filling in data and not not actually sitting there so it does happen but um yeah okay yeah. thanks mary yeah that was unfortunate actually one time he was sleeping in his truck and he submitted data for the time that he was sleeping he said he had a boat so um it's but a thing and it's like not that. no it's not the norm um, but we do need to keep tabs. So I am going to share Lake Stewards of Maine, and I again will send out the link to this page because um, it's a little bit buried on their website. But the Lake Stewards of Maine have uh, put together this nice uh, page for reporting a suspicious aquatic species. So my method is going to be, I'm going to have inspectors send me pictures of plants that they find. Um, if I look at that plant and I'm not sure what it is and whether or not it is invasive, I am then going to send those pictures along to the Lake Stewards of Maine. There needs to be a gatekeeper for this process. So there needs to be somebody in your organization that's in charge of sending those pictures to Lake Stewards of Maine. I would not suggest giving this link out to all of your inspectors um, because not everybody uh, will be able to take appropriate, not like a, the, take pictures of the plants in such a way that they'll be able to be um, identifiable. So there is this online suspicious plant form um, and that is for submitting the photos. I'm going to just scroll down 
a little bit because uh, they have a lot of information about um, collecting the set the specimen and then right down here this is really important sending the photo um, Roberta Hill who works at Lake Stewart's of Maine she's told me some of the pictures she gets are, are unidentifiable. She, she, there's no way she could identify a plant from some of those pictures. So this has a nice little guide of how to take a picture and, and send it and have it be something that they could actually um, realistically identify from the picture that you sent. And always people should keep the physical sample until you have an answer. Um, and it needs to be kept cold. So if you have it in a plastic bag, you just put it in the fridge. And once you get an answer about if it's invasive or not, then you can discard it. But Lake Stewart's of Maine might also come back and say, we need to see that. Because if it turns out to be something invasive, um, they'll need to, to see the actual specimen. So I'm gonna click on the form. Don't have a lot of time, so I don't wanna. So it is a, a Google Docs um, form and you put in, yeah, so your name, what group you're with, mailing address, phone number. So you'll see the little red asterisks, those are required. So not all of these fields are required, um, but I mean, the more ways they have to contact you, the better, in my opinion. Um, are you a, a certified plant patroller? So for CBI, you would probably say no. Uh, and then plant submitted by affiliate. Wait, we already did that. Oh, only complete if different from collector. Okay, cool. Um, and then plant sample information, when it was collected, the water body, the Midas number, you might not necessarily know that, um, but it doesn't have the red asterisk, so this is not a required section. Um, town, county, so all of these things, all the way down at the bottom is where you upload your, your photo. Um, so if you have the photo on your, on your phone, you can fill this out on your phone. If the photo is on your phone and you want to submit this on your computer, you have to email the photo to yourself on your computer so that you have it. Um, and then way down at the bottom was the sample collected as part of a courtesy boat inspection. Um, so we would click that so that they have that information. And I don't want to go through this thing because I'm afraid that it will take too long to load. But um, this is a nice, a really nice tool um, that Lake Stewards of Maine has put together. I'm, I'm grateful for it and I think it's going to streamline things. But again, it needs to come from one person in your organization. So you decide what needs to be sent and whoever it is, whether it's yourself or you have a plant expert or, or whoever it is, um, needs to be the contact person that's going to be sending these, um, these samples. And, um, and I think every organization is going to maybe have a, a slightly different procedure on that. Um, for me, working at LEA, we have um, people on staff that have a lot of plant knowledge. We've been doing it for a long, long time. So I'll be able to narrow things down more so. Um, but with an invasive species, even if I know it's Eurasian milfoil, I'm still going to send a picture of it to the Lake Stewards of Maine. Because um, I, I can pretty easily identify that, but that needs to be, that, that record needs to be um, on file because that would be considered a save and, uh, and we need that. So, um, okay. I, yeah. I think I think that's it, Mary. I think we've come to the end of our agenda. Um, there is, uh, Becky, a request for a repeat on what they do if they download the app and it says you need to sign in. Maybe you could type an answer to them. Um, the last thing that I think I is up there that I did not um, address, someone asked us to go over how to do a jet ski inspection. So I'm wondering, Mary, if you want to discuss that. And we do have 10 minutes. Yes. So jet skis are special <laughs> um, because they do, um, they have this intake. So sometimes plants can get sucked up inside of, of the intake. 
Um, I had an experience last year of, of jet ski coming in from Massachusetts that had Eurasian milfoil just hanging down out of that intake. Um, and, and the jet skier was completely oblivious. And so the inspector was like, hey, what the heck? And tried to get as much as possible, but um, she, she wasn't going to stick her hand up inside of the jet ski. And sometimes you can't. Um, and we don't have a special tool for that. So um, you do the best you can. And we certainly always visually inspect as much as possible um, any place that is visually accessible to you. Um, but especially since we're not touching uh, things as much as, I mean, especially a jet ski, because they, you know, they're going to touch every part of that jet ski because it's small and um, so they're more likely to be handling uh, more parts of that. But I mean, that was found at Sebago Lake State Park going in. This summer, next summer, the following summer, we're going to be doing surveys there for Eurasian milfoil. Because when that jet ski enters the water and takes off, it's going to shoot water up and through and probably fragments of Eurasian milfoil came up out of that jet ski. Um, so we do the best we can and we keep track of that and, and we're going to be down there looking, looking for that particular plant. Because we can't tell anybody they can't launch. No matter what, we're not allowed to do that. So um, even if they have a known invasive species on their on their boat or or jet ski or trailer, um, we can't we can't say no. So all we can do is educate. And the person um, that particular jet skier when they when they came back out of the lake, they did apologize <laughs> to the inspector. They hadn't even thought about it. And I guess while they were tootling around Sebago Lake, when they came back. Um, they'd had a chance to kind of think about the, the potential consequences of that action and, um, and did apologize. But we're not ever gonna be able to do everything. Um, and we're gonna do, do the best that we can. And now with those restrictions, I mean, a jet ski, you're not six feet away from somebody if you're on the other side of the jet ski. Uh, so you're gonna have to be more mindful of that, um, that six feet distance, um, you're going to maybe have to make more conscious decisions about your body placement um, with that. <laughs> Sarah, I like that. All right. Um, I did just post a link uh, to the Lake Stewards of Maine Invasive Aquatic Species Handbook for, so it's pertinent for Maine um, plants. It shows both invasive and native plants. You guys might want to explore that. And I really, I think I've addressed everything or tried to is, this is your last chance to type in a question <laughs> and we're done. And you I guys will, have been awesome, that was I really, think. I think that went really great. Um, and I will be sending all the links out, including contacts for Karen and Becky and myself. So if you have any questions about anything we said um, or showed you, we are available. Um, my little presentation at the beginning, Becky's presentation on how to install. Um, once we have the link for the dashboard, we'll send that out, uh, the link for my video. So it, um, yeah, so you, we're going to be sending out um, all of this information, uh, including contacts for questions. I said that I would put up the link, the, U, the QR code and the link to the app again once we were done presenting. So for the last few minutes, is it okay if I just share that screen? Yeah. If we're done. Yeah. Um, yes. One more thing, Becky, also I can um, create just a, a simple document that has the QR code and people can just print that out and scan it from a, from a page. You can give it to inspectors to scan it. Um, off it's in the instructions. Yeah. So, but yeah, if you just want to. Yeah, but you have the JPEG or whatever. Yeah. That you can send me. We can do that. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. That's it. Are you, be yeah, Becky's sharing something. Okay. 
yeah, so just in case anyone needed to grab the uh, web web address or the QR code, and they're the same thing, they're just different ways of accessing the same web page. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> But that, that's a good point that um, actually having that, Adam said, printing it out and laminating it um, so that anybody can, um, can click that or um, take a picture of it and, and download the, the survey. But remember, you can only download the survey if you have the Survey123 app on your device. Um, so. Okay, I I think that's it. If not, you have our emails. You can contact us each individually. And boy, you guys have been awesome. I, I thank you so much. At one point, we had eighty people. That's or ninety people on the calls. Uh, so, yeah. Wow, we're learning. We've come been dragged into the twenty first century, kicking and screaming <laughs> with use of this technology. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Right. I guess. Bye, uh, everybody. I'm going to end this. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.